So, lovely to see everyone, lovely to see so many former colleagues who no doubt will be wondering what on earth I've been up to the last 30 years since I left the Royal. Uh, and what I'm going to do tonight is try and explain to you what I've been up to. And I'm going to try and answer these two questions. What is well-being and what causes it? Now, the first question, what is well-being, to the medics in the audience might sound daft because everyone knows that being well is not being ill. At least that's what a medical education gives us. It teaches us about disease and the causes of disease. And that's it, really. Pathogenesis, the origins of, of disease, really is what most of the time a medical degree is about. But of course, in 1940, the World Health Organization defined health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of illness or infirmity. So the absence of illness is only a bit of this. And it's this state of complete physical, mental and especially social well-being that I became interested in many years ago working at the Royal Infirmary. But the other point I want to make tonight is about what causes it and what the consequences are from understanding, from the way in which we understand well-being. In philosophical terms, there's a spectrum about how people behave and how people are and so on. At the one end, it's free will. We make our own choices. And whenever I go to America to talk about social determinants of health, they take the view that, well, you make your choices and you live with them. And people are poor and people are addicted and so on because they've made the wrong choices in life. At the other end, the deterministic end of the spectrum is, well, it's the environment. And it's what happens to us that shapes our life and so on. My conclusion is it's much more complicated than that. And we have politicians who espouse opposite ends of that spectrum and public policy suffers as a result. I would argue, having spent a long time in public policy, that most of it actually fails because it's of a simplistic approach to a complex system. But that's something we may get to in discussion. So, 30 years ago, I was operating on people who lived in these houses. And you look at those houses, which were in the east end of Glasgow, and you see that that guy walking through the middle of that scene is probably going to be very unhealthy. If you can't see quite, his hand is up to his mouth, presumably he's smoking. And we just know that people who lived in that environment had a, and still have, a far lower life expectancy than people who lived a few miles up the road in Lindsay or Bears Den or whatever. I show this slide for two reasons. One, to crystallise the kind of population that I'm talking about, but other to make the point that just because you come from a background like that doesn't mean you're destined to fail. I was once showing this slide in a business school, and in the front row there was the professor of strategic management who immediately put up his hand and said, that's Acre Hill Street in Black Hill. I was born in those flats. <laughs> so you can come from those backgrounds and succeed, as long as you think that being a professor of strategic management <laughs> is a success. <laughs> the other point about that slide is the... Um, oops, wrong one. The other point about that slide is the mural on the Gable End. Someone in the city council obviously thought that a good way of improving the quality of life in that place was to paint a mural of a corporation bus on a gable end. Maybe if they'd asked the guy what he needed, they would have got a much more appropriate solution. Anyway, more of this anon. So, over the years, I've worked very closely with colleagues at Glasgow University, with colleagues in the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and so on. And a lot of what I'm going to describe to you is what the, these organisations have generated. And to put things in context, this is what the newspapers tell us about Scotland's health. Okay? This is, we are told incessantly that we are unhealthy. And we're unhealthy because we smoke too much. We eat the wrong kind of food, 
we drink too much, and if only we'd get a grip of ourselves and do the right thing, we'd be healthy. It's all about our decisions, the decisions we make on a day-to-day basis, okay? Well, in fact, only one of those statements is true when you subject them to close scrutiny. And regrettably, the one that's true (laughs) is that one, okay? If you're thinking about going out to the pub after this, be careful. So, is Scotland an unhealthy place? This slide shows life expectancy in 16 Western European countries going back to 1851. There is 160 years worth of data on that slide. And you can see that for most of that time, Scottish life expectancy has been at the middle, the European, Western European average. No better, no worse than anyone else. It's only in the past five or six decades that we have drifted to the back of the pack And if you look at the rate of growth and life expectancy in the richest 20% of the population, you can see that they have done significantly better than the European average. The rate of growth and life expectancy in the poorest 20% of the population, however, this machine ain't working. Is it not working? (laughs) This is unhealthy, this thing. No, you have to see it to believe it. (laughs) Right. Okay. Don't don't speak too soon. So you can see here that the rate... Ah! (laughs) So the rate of growth and life expectancy in the poorest 20% of the population... Has that? Since the 1950s, there's been a divergence in life expectancy between rich and poor. And it's not the the uber-rich, it's the top 20% versus the bottom 20%. And that decline in rate of growth and life expectancy in the poorest 20% has been what has slowed down the Scottish average. So only some of the population is unhealthy. And it's not due to smoking. This slide shows smoking rates in 15-year-old teenagers in the countries of the European region of the World Health Organization. Scottish teenagers are the fifth lowest smokers in Europe. All these countries with higher life expectancies than us, their teenagers smoke more. Scottish males in this study were the third lowest smokers in Europe, beaten only by the Finns and Swedes. Scottish females let us chaps down a bit by being closer to the European average, but we're not where we are because we're the worst smokers in Europe. What about diet? Okay, so the, the, the classic population intervention to improve diet, to improve health, was carried out in Finland, the North Karelia project. In the 1960s, they concluded here, this is... The heart attack death rates in men under the age of 75 in Finland. And in the 1960s, they had a very high death rate, and they decided it was all due to too much fat in the diet. So they decided to change the diet. And I once asked the director of the Finnish Institute of Public Health, how did he change the diet? And what he said to me, and this is verbatim, what he said was, well, the Finnish Institute of Public Health told the Finnish government what to do, the Finnish government told the Finnish people what to do, and the Finnish people did it. (laughs) 
So my response was, well, that's Scotland stuff then, because we never do anything they were told. What they did was they took the subsidies away from dairy farmers to discourage them from producing milk, butter, cream, cheese, etc., thereby making the Finns the most miserable people in Europe. <laughs> and they gave them subsidies back if they'd switched to growing fruit and vegetables. They made free fruit and free salads compulsory in all schools and workplaces. And then they stood back and marveled at the results. Okay, significant reductions. Must be due to the change in diet. Well... That line is Scotland. <laughs> so the Finns took radical action to change their diet. The Scots invented the deep fried Mars bar. <laughs> and we've got the same results. Okay? Actually, this is post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. All right? We did something and something happened, therefore, what happened was due to what we did. Actually, the main thing that led to that significant reduction was men gave up smoking in enormous numbers in the 1960s. That was the decade where the penny dropped with men and they gave up smoking. And also we began to see the introduction of better therapies. And every Western country has seen a significant reduction in death rates from heart disease. The booze. What about the booze? This slide shows death rates in our 16 Western European countries going back to 1950. The line at the top is the highest mortality any country reached, and for the first couple of decades that was France. The line at the bottom is the lowest mortality any of our countries reached, and the line in the middle is the mean of our 16 Western European countries. From 1950 to 1970, Scotland had one of the lowest alcoholic cirrhosis death rates in Western Europe. This notion of the Scots as happy drunks is a myth. Because apart from anything else, we're never happy. <laughs> from 1950, 1970 to 1990, it went up a bit, but it was still below the European average. And then from 1990, that's what happened. For both men and women, we went from being one of the lowest to being the highest in Western Europe. And when you think about the drinking culture in the 1950s, well, who drank? Men drank. What did they drink? Beer. Where did they drink it? In the pub. When did they drink it? After work on a Friday night. Now who drinks? Everyone. What did they drink? Everything they can get their hands on. <laughs> Where do they drink it? Everywhere. And when do they drink it? Seven days a week. The culture has changed and we have embraced that culture. But that's the main thing that we have uh, embraced, if you like. So Alistair Leyland, who works at Glasgow University, began, like the rest of us, to question this. What is causing this inequality? And most people would assume that the inequality in death rate between rich and poor is due to the fact that poor people tend to die more of heart disease and cancer. That's what most folk die of. Therefore, that's presumably what's driving the inequality. But Alistair went a stage further to probe in some detail what was causing it. And he did a clever thing with the data. What he did was, for each five-year age group, for men and women, he plotted death rates by deprivation category. So the death rate for the most affluent people here, and men, men in that upper 60 age band, about 1,500 deaths a year per 100,000 population in that age group, all the way down to the poorest age group. And by, oops, there's a line, line missing there. Um, by subtracting the best from the worst and dividing by the mean, you come up with a single number called the slope index of inequality that reflects how steep the, the difference is between rich and poor. And by plotting the slope index of inequality for each five-year age band, you can see that inequality in death rates in Scotland are largely driven by inequalities in deaths in teenagers, people in their 20s, 30s, and it starts to come down in their 40s. Young working age people and teenagers, these are not the people dying of heart disease and cancer. So he went a stage further. He plotted death rates 
for individual causes of death. This is heart disease, and he calculated the slope index of inequality. And you can plot that on the thing, and you can see that heart disease barely contributes to inequalities in survival. It does a bit in people in their 50s and 60s, but it's not the main driver. So what's the main driver of this inequality, widening inequality in Scottish mortality and life expectancy? It's drugs, suicide, diseases due to alcohol, violence and accidents. Drugs, alcohol, suicide and violence. We're not going to fix that by persuading people to reduce the saturated fat content of their diet. <laughs> this is a complex, socially driven problem. And we need to be thinking quite cleverly to make some difference occur. Now that gave people the excuse to start talking about the Glasgow effect. And that was a term I hated because it didn't seem to me that there was anything special about Glasgow. Glasgow was a city where in the 50s and 60s you had collapse of heavy industry, lots of men lost their jobs, you had collapse of community as the traditional housing scheme, houses were knocked down and garbles and so on, and people were transplanted to Easter House, to um, Cumbernauld, to Irvine, the new towns and so on. And what I used to say was Glasgow got austerity 50 years before anyone else. And then a couple of years ago, proof emerged. Angus Deaton, a Scot who's a Nobel Prize winning economist working in Princeton, published data on what he called deaths of despair. What he found was that men in their 50s, white, blue collar workers, non-African American, non-Hispanic workers in America without a college education between the year 2000 and 2014 saw a 240% increase in deaths from drugs, alcohol and suicide. That's the Glasgow effect. But only this wasn't happening in Glasgow. This was happening all the way across America. The Brookings Institution in Washington recently published that graph which showed that the counties that voted for Trump were the counties that saw the highest incidence of deaths of despair. What we're seeing as a result of austerity is the rise of right-wing fringe parties across Europe. People are turning away from conventional political discourse to folk that, well... You know, he may be mad, but maybe he'll do something different. Very worrying. So, with that kind of background that maybe challenges what your concept of wellness are, what causes it? And I mentioned the word pathogenesis at the start, the causes of disease, the origins of disease. Salutogenesis is a term that's been uh, coined to describe the causes of well-being. Salus was the Roman goddess of well-being and safety, and colleagues in the Nordic School of Public Health have produced this slide, which clusters 25 different theories under the umbrella of salutogenesis, and obviously I'm going to take you through them all one by one. <laughs> no, I'm not. Just to mention a couple, or even not to mention a couple, well, I'll mention one. If you take those 25 different theories and distill them down, the common features of them all are these. People tend to do well in difficult circumstances if they have acquired an optimistic outlook on life, if they feel that they are in control of their lives, not other people, they can take control, if they have a sense of purpose, if they have a reason for staying well, if they feel confident in their ability to deal with the problems that their circumstances throw at them, and particularly if they have a supportive network of people, and, as we will discuss, if they come from a nurturing family. And I'll just mention two of those theories. One, Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychotherapist who spent four or five years of the war in Auschwitz and survived, and he wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. He and the men with him who survived the horrors of Auschwitz 
had to stay alive because they had a purpose and their purpose was usually family. Their wife had been taken away from them and they didn't know where their children were. They had to stay alive in order to go and find their family. They had, they had an optimistic outlook that everything would be okay and they knew what to do to survive and they did it. And he, what he said was, if you have a why to live, you can cope with almost any how. Aaron Antonovsky, an American sociologist who also investigated Holocaust survivors, went to Israel to work to, to study the health of adults who as children had been in concentration camps. He concluded that children who acquired a, the correct view of the world when they were young had this property of feeling in control. What Antonovsky said, he described it as a sense of coherence. It's a sense that you find the, the social and physical one round about you as being understandable, manageable, and meaningful. And what he said that really made sense to me was, unless you found the one round about you as understandable, manageable, and meaningful, you would experience a state of chronic stress. Now, as soon as I read, I remember vividly reading those two words, and I sat bolt upright, because I'd been a surgeon, and as Alan says, did a lot of work with the biochemists. A surgeon's job is to create acute stress in people. <laughs> Seriously. The stress response is the body's defense mechanism. When it's threatened, whether socially by horrible circumstances, or whether it's threatened by the surgeon's knife, the body has to repair itself. So it produces cortisol and adrenaline and so on to allow energy to flow through the body, and it stimulates various proteins in order to start the healing process. What Antonovsky was saying, well, actually, if you have a difficult childhood, you switch on the stress response and it stays on permanently. And I thought, this is the missing link. This is what links the social circumstances to physical ill health. Now, I was only partly right, because that was the start of a whole chain of evidence that I found that showed what the, the process was. We started to look for evidence that cortisol, that's one of the main stress hormones, was elevated, and we found thousands of studies that showed that. This is Canadian data that looks at cortisol levels in children in orphanages. The longer a child is absent from a single significant adult to relate to, the more stressed it becomes. This is the Whitehall study. Um, this is Michael Marmot's study of 30,000 civil servants carried out for many, many years. And what this shows is that in an occupational hierarchy, the higher up you are in the hierarchy, the less stressed you are. Okay? <laughs> this is daytime cortisol profiles. Cortisol is always highest in the morning, goes down before you go to sleep at night. Higher grade civil servants in the purple line are less stressed throughout the day than lower grade civil servants in the red line. The least stressed person in any government department is the permanent secretary. <laughs> and they used to love it when I told them that. And the reason is that if a minister asks a permanent secretary to do something he doesn't fancy doing, what does he do? Get somebody else to do it. And if they don't fancy it, they get someone else to do it. It goes down the hierarchy till the person at the bottom gets all the crap nobody else wants to do. And that's usually the chief medical officer, I have to say. <laughs> control is the lesson from this. The more control you have over your life, the less stressed you are. And of course, life expectancy of permanent secretaries is greater than life expectancy of people at the bottom of the civil service hierarchy. Control, this is another example, control. Martin Bobak from University College London went round the countries of the former Soviet bloc ten years after the fall of the Berlin Wall and asked people how much control they felt they had of their lives and related that to annual death rate in the country. Russians reported the lowest level of control, had the highest death rate, polls and checks, high levels of control, lowest death rate. You see there, Hungary is a bit higher than the Poles and Czechs. They have high levels of control too, but they have an interesting way with booze. They make their own in the bath. 
So I'm told. That's, that's my Hungarian friends tell me that accounts for this. And this business of optimistic outlook, again, there's lots of evidence. I'll just show you this one. Susan Everson was an American lady who went to Finland to study the health of these adults who has children, um, these, these, adults, these adult males, rather, who were at high risk of death from heart disease. She measured every risk factor you could think of. She measured their smoking, their alcohol consumption, their weight, their educational attainment and so on. And one of the things she also measured was hopelessness. She had a scoring system that allowed her to split men into three groups. Those that were very, very hopeless, those that were moderately hopeless, and those that were just a little bit hopeless because she was a woman. And she knew that all men are hopeless to this <laughs> But what she found was that men who were in the most negative mindset were four times more likely to die of heart disease and two and a half times more likely to die of cancer than men who were optimistic. And she couldn't explain that by virtue of the fact that they smoked more or drank more. She was able to adjust for all these other risk factors in the statistical analysis. So positive outlook... I know that can be hard when you're a Scotland supporter, but, you know, <laughs> positive outlook is very important to well-being. So the next bit of the jigsaw came when I'm trying to piece together this link between social circumstances and premature mortality. The next piece of the jigsaw came when I saw an experiment in the psychology department of a New York university, and the experiment they did was to make baby monkeys depressed. Okay? That's clearly not a happy baby monkey. And the way they made the baby monkeys depressed was all down to the way they let mum feed the baby. One half of the animal house, mum and baby are playing and they're swinging about and so on. And when baby indicated he was hungry, mum could bend down, pick up the food, feed the baby. The other half of the animal house, they took the food away and hid it. So that when baby indicated he needed food, Mum had to go away and forage for it, so she was away a long time. And she also was stressed because she'd fight with other mums to get access to it. So if I were to ask you, which group of babies do you think became depressed? Was it ones where mum found it easy to feed them? Or the ones where mum was away a lot and stressed by being away? You'd probably think it was the second group, wouldn't you? And usually when asked that question, I can spot who the working mums are in a room. <laughs> well, ladies, you needn't worry. It made no difference. <laughs> These were the stress hormone levels where mum found it easy to feed the babies, and those were the stress hormone levels where mum found it hard to feed the babies, and they were the same. But those were the stress hormone levels in the babies where they randomly changed the feeding pattern from one day to the next. It wasn't mum being there or mum not being there. It was baby not knowing what was happening. It was inconsistency. And if you think about it, first thing a human baby feels, first stressor he feels, hunger. What does he do? He cries. Mum picks him up, cuddles him, talks to him, feeds him, stress resolved. This is the start of a tennis match. You know, cry, resolve the stress. And by the time that's happened a thousand times, baby knows the one that's structured, predictable, and he's in control. <laughs> Do the crying thing, this person comes along, fixes it, no problem. <laughs> Develops that sense of coherence that Antonovsky talked about. Contrast that to the experience of a baby who, when he cries, sometimes gets fed, but sometimes doesn't because mum's drunk or under the influence of drugs. And even worse, the boyfriend picks baby up and shakes him and slaps him because he doesn't know how to handle a crying baby. Baby learns the one that's not structured, is not predictable, he has no control. And when he does the one thing he's programmed to do in response to our stress, it hurts. No sense of coherence there. The next stage was the people who were doing this study began to examine the brains of the stressed and unstressed babies. And what they found was that chronic stress in early life led to significant changes in brain growth in three critical areas. The prefrontal cortex, which is a bit of the brain that allows you to make 
clever decisions, allows you to make any decision. So you take in new information, you process it in the prefrontal cortex, and you respond. The amygdala, so the prefrontal cortex does not develop so well in stressed babies. The amygdala is a bit of the brain associated with emotional arousal, and that becomes more active in these babies. And the hippocampus is a bit of the brain associated with memory. So these babies are less well able to learn. So what you've got is a kid, potentially in a human situation, who goes to school less well able to learn, is more emotionally aroused, more anxious, aggressive, fearful, and less well able to control himself. So when he gets bullied for being stupid, he's likely to lash out and he's likely to be excluded from school. Sound familiar to the teachers in the room? Now we took that, that was all experimental stuff, and we didn't want to take experiment in animals as being applicable to your average Glaswegian. So we went out into the streets of Glasgow and we scanned brains, and I was slightly worried about going down the East End. Hey mate, can we scan your brain? But I needn't have worried. What, you mean you're going to tell me I've got a brain? <laughs> can I get a certificate? <laughs> well, I mean, these guys have spent their lives being told they're stupid. So, and we found it. We measured hippocampal volume, we measured cell density in the prefrontal cortex, and we went a stage further, and it was exactly as the, the animal studies suggested. We went a stage further, we measured the performance of these centres, the choice reaction time measures your prefrontal cortex activity. What choice reaction time showed here was that, on average, if you present some evidence to people and ask them to press a, a button on a computer quickly in response to it, people coming from the most deprived parts of Glasgow took on average about 200 milliseconds longer to hit the right button. Now, that doesn't sound very much, but if you think of two cars being driven side by side, one by somebody with a cohesive upbringing, one by someone coming from a difficult upbringing, being driven 50 miles an hour and a child walks out in front of them, the car being driven by the guy with a difficult upbringing will take about two car lengths longer to stop. The disadvantage accrues in all sorts of ways that you can't quite understand at first. So why does the cortisol level become chronically elevated? And this was the final piece of the jigsaw, the final chain in the evidence. And it's epigenetic action. Epigenetic, you know, you know we, get, we inherit all these genes. Well, it doesn't matter so much how, what genes we inherit. What really matters is when they're turned on and turned off. And that's the study of epigenetics. And what we find, this is the molecular biology of a cuddle, Okay, so what happens when you cuddle a baby? Probably what happens when you cuddle me, but that depends on who's doing the cuddling. <laughs> Whenever you feel comforted and nurtured, you're happy. And there's a, a chemical messenger called 5-hydroxytryptamine, also known as serotonin, is released in the brain and circul circulates in the bloodstream. When it's picked up by a, trans uh, by a transport mechanism and goes into the cell, Chromosome number 5 has a gene on it called the glucocorticoid receptor gene. When it binds onto serotonin, it's activated and it produces a protein that allows the brain to recognise that cortisol is high, and it then sends signals down to the adrenals to switch off cortisol production. Children who do not feel nurtured do not develop the glucocorticoid receptor gene activity and therefore they're chronically less able to switch off their stress response. And therefore they get the brain changes that makes it difficult for them to succeed in life. And it goes even further. Some of the, these genes are actually inherited. There's a thing called the warrior gene, uh, monoamine oxidase type A, which destroys serotonin. And if you've got this gene, it means you're working with a chronically low level of serotonin and therefore you get all the other problems. And it was discovered, this guy, um, what is his, what's his name again? Who, what's his name? 
So he's from Paisley, somebody tells me. <laughs> in fact, my next door neighbour tells me he's from Paisley because she was in his class at school and I think she quite fancied him. <laughs> but uh, the only film of his I've ever seen is this one, Olympus Has Fallen, in which he is a secret service agent in the White House and 200 fanatical terrorists invade the White House and they kill everybody except him because he's away doing something in the basement or whatever. And they then capture, they get the president and they try to get the launch codes off him. And I'm sitting there thinking, so there's 200 fanatical terrorists and there's a boy in the basement from Paisley <laughs> with a gun. <laughs> no contest. <laughs> so sure enough, he saves the world. But, so the warrior gene is a real thing and it's, they call it the warrior gene when they discovered it. He said, where in the world are the most warlike people? So they went and studied the, the populations that do the haka before rugby matches. Went to Samoa, they went to New Zealand, the Maori and so on. And they have significantly higher levels of monoamine oxidase type A compared to anyone else. So this is, this is real. This is what's happening out there. So let's look at what the consequences are for children who experience adversity in early life, who experience that kind of inconsistency, and even worse than inconsistency, actual physical abuse and neglect and domestic violence and so on. In the 1980s, Kaiser Permanente Health System in California, which was an insurance system, and if you belonged to Kaiser Permanente, you were middle class, you weren't working class, they started a weight reduction clinic and they got everyone who was overweight and they began to get their weight down and so on. And then they noticed that some people who could lose weight perfectly well were putting weight back on again. And the guy who started it, um, Vincent Felitti, started asking them, you know, what, what's going on here? And what emerged was that a lot of the people who found it difficult to lose weight were experiencing, had, had experienced neglect, abuse, domestic violence, parental mental health problems. So the weight reduction clinic metamorphosed into a study of adverse childhood experiences. Basically, they looked at these, they asked the population, did they have any of these? Middle class Californians, 60% of them reported one, 13% of them reported four or more. If you had four or more adverse events in your life, you were eight times more likely to become an alcoholic, 12 times more likely to become a narcotics abuser. Boys who experienced physical violence at the hands of an older male, eight times more likely to engage in partner violence themselves, four times more likely to have been arrested for carrying weapons. Drugs, alcohol, suicide, <coughs> violence, criminal convictions, relating strongly to experiences in childhood. If you look at the pattern of adverse outcome in the adverse childhood experiences study, small increased risk of premature death from heart disease and cancer, and then these are all drugs, alcohol, suicide, mental health problems, that's the pattern of excess mortality seen in Glasgow compared to cities like Liverpool and Manchester. Could it be that the turmoil that afflicted Glasgow in the 1950s and 60s had created that breakdown in family structure that led to these outcomes that we're seeing now? Possibly. Oops. Dunedin, South Island of New Zealand, carried out a similar study to the ACES study. They identified 1,000 children in the early 70s. They identified a subgroup at risk because of chaotic circumstances in which they were living. In their 40s now, they're more likely to be unemployed, have criminal convictions for violence, experience teenage pregnancy, have a substance misuse problem, and they are showing signs of the metabolic changes that will lead to diabetes and heart disease. This is what happens if you have a poor childhood. The economic cost of one year's worth of child neglect, that cohort of children born in 1960, by the time they die, they will have cost the American economy 
$124 billion in terms of increased costs of health care, increased costs of caring for them when, they, when their families break down, increased costs of caring for them when they go to jail, the fact that they do badly at school and never work, they never pay taxes, and they have increased risks of chronic disease later on in life. And indeed, some of the stuff I'm hearing from colleagues in America now suggests that that $124 billion may be a very significant underestimate. So the costs to our society of poor childhood, disrupted families, are astronomical. This is what happens. It's not just the first few months of life that are the problem. This slide, which comes from the... the uh, Dunedin study, they looked at children who scored at age two on the 90th centile for developmental progress, for cognitive function. So here you had affluent children on the 90th centile who by the time you reached 10 were still pretty much, they were still about the 70th centile in terms of cognitive performance. If you came from a poor home, but age two you were on the 90th centile, your performance degraded over the next eight years. If you came from an affluent home and you were on the 10th centile age too, you more or less recovered over the next few years, whereas if you were poor, you never actually recovered. So it's not just the first few months of life, it's that grinding down of kids over the first 10 years. So, when we think about policy to reduce things like heart disease and diabetes and lung cancer and so on, what we tend to think of is that it's the behaviours that we adopt. If only we would stop smoking and take exercise and change our diet, we would reduce those outcomes. Okay? But actually, our ability to choose the right things to do and our ability to commit ourselves to the right things depends very much on having that sense of well-being, having that sense of purpose, sense of control, and so on. And if you don't acquire that in early life, you're up against it in later life. What I would argue we have seen in Scotland over the past 50 years is a cycle of alienation. Kids living in chaotic circumstances, workless homes, significant increased risk of mental health problems, things that like violent behaviour, inconsistent behaviour attributed to mental health problems. They go to school, they cause problems, they get excluded from school, they get into fights, they go to jail, and I go to jail quite often. Usually let, they let me out. But you ask these 18-year-olds, what are you going to do when you get out? Ugh, I'll never get a job, I've got a criminal record. So what are you going to do? Ugh, I'll just sit at home. I'll watch telly and I'll drink. And what they never say is, by the way, the girlfriend will probably have a couple of babies. So they have that low sense of self-esteem, low sense of control, and the baby is born into a workless home and the cycle continues. And of course, the man I first heard talk about alienation was this man, Jimmy Reid. In 1971, we elected him Lord Rector of Glasgow University. His rectorial address was reprinted in full in the New York Times, which described it as the single most important public speech since the Gettysburg Address. And to those of us in the room that day, that comparison of Jimmy Reid with Abraham Lincoln was very flattering to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> it was about alienation. The cry of men who feel themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control. The frustration of ordinary people excluded from the process of decision making, feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with justification they have no say in shaping or determining their own destinies. He nailed it. That's the deaths of despair that we have seen in Glasgow and they're now seeing in America. And if we're going to fix it, we've got to tackle the circumstances that lead to those deaths of despair. And a whole load of things have been done over the years that produce change. Minimum income, universal basic income, trialed initially in Canada and the United States, reduced domestic violence, reduced hospitalization significantly, increased high school graduations. However, Richard Nixon was about to take a bill 
to Congress to make universal basic income law in North America, would you believe? But it was torpedoed by the report that in the city of Seattle, universal basic income led to a 50% increase in div divorce rate. It appeared to them that this is what happens when you give women financial independence, they divorce their husbands. <laughs> A few years, so the whole bill was scuppered, and a few years later, they found it was a lie. It was fake news. It was manufactured in order to torpedo the, the idea. Another experiment that began to show me, well, what, the, what must we do to, to make this better? The Broadway experiment was carried out in the city of London. They had 13 rough sleepers who were perennial rough sleepers. They, between them they had a four, t the shortest time anyone had been rough sleeping was four years, the longest time was 45 years, which is pretty good going because 45 years is about the life expectancy of a rough sleeper. And these folk had cost them about a million pounds a year over the previous years in terms of different benefits and things that they tried to do. So they decided to do things differently. Instead of going to them and saying, right, there's a voucher for that hostel or, you know. Instead of telling them what to do, they decided to ask them, what do you need? What matters to you in achieving a better lifestyle? And that process built a sense of trust between the individual and the social worker who was doing it. She wasn't telling them what to do. She was saying, what do you need? Let's work together. Let's build that, that sense of control. The, when the results came in, the economist concluded this. The most efficient way to spend money on the homeless might be to give it to them. What the, what the City of London did was they gave each of the 13 rough sleepers a bank account with £3,000 in it. The social worker asked them what did they need, and she was surprised by the responses. One guy asked for a new hearing aid. One guy asked for... Uh, a pair of spectacles. One guy said, the only time in my life I've ever been happy was when I used to go with, on holiday with my parents to this caravan park in, in Kent. Could you see if there's a disused caravan that I might go and stay in? By the end of the year, 11 of the 13 were in permanent accommodation and the average spend from each of the bank accounts was £780. Here in Glasgow, the Wheatley Group, Martin Armstrong, the, chief, the Wheatley Group is Scotland's largest housing association, developed from Glasgow Housing Association. Martin Armstrong, the chief executive, MP, uh, uh, started this programme, Think Yes, in which every single member of the staff in the Wheatley Group is told, if a member of the public comes to you with a problem, you work with them to fix the problem. Don't hand them off. Don't tell them to go to that office. Don't give them a form to fill in. Work with them fix the problem. Now, it all came about because he was asked by a counsellor to go and see a woman who was suicidal. And he went into the house and he said, I diagnosed the problem in five minutes. She was suicidal because she had two autistic children who had to be kept in the house 24-7. She never got any respite from them. And the reason they had to be kept in the house was because if they were allowed out, they would wander away and get lost. And the reason they would wander away and get lost was because there was no fence around the garden. So Martin got hold of the housing officer and said, what about this fence? Oh, I know about the fence, but I can't build it until I get a health and safety assessment. <laughs> build the fence. No, no, the rules say, buck the rules, I'm the boss, build the fence. Fence built, problem solved. And when you begin to ask people, when you begin to get under the surface and say, what really is the problem here? You discover simple solutions that fixing them with the person transforms that individual's ability to tackle things. What must the children living in circumstances like that be experiencing in terms of adverse events? We're stoking up huge problems for ourselves if we don't begin to tackle these kind of world problems differently. These kids are going to be alienated, and that will not be good for the rest of the world. Whereas if we showed them some compassion and some support, then it might be different. <laughs>
The city of Stoke-on-Trent did a really interesting thing for, about this sort of stuff. They used their data to segment the population into those who were managing perfectly well, those that were struggling a bit, and they identified 1,500 people who were chaotic. They then calculated how much they were spending on each of these 1,500 people, and it came out at about £100,000 each, mainly in social work, local authority, having broken windows fixed and so on, health service spending a bit, criminal justice spending a bit. And then they started this what matters to you approach. Let us work with you to solve these problems. A year later, that £100,000 had fallen to £2,000 per person. We weren't going to social work, housing, housing authority, health service, less demand, Criminal justice costs almost disappeared. The only bit of the public sector that was spending more money was education because the kids were going to school more often. So we need to be thinking about doing things differently. Joseph Townsend was a Church of England cleric who, were he alive today, would probably be working for the Department of Work and Pensions. <laughs> he was also a medical doctor. And as a graduate of Glasgow University, I'm delighted to tell you he was a medical graduate of Edinburgh University. <laughs> but that is still the attitude that is out there in many individuals' minds. These people make this choice, so we have to give them incentives. So we have fat children. Let's tax sugar. That'll fix the problem. Well, actually, when you look at the biochemistry, the centres in the brain associated with feeling full, are resistant to the effects of insulin. So they eat, and their brain never gets the signals that says we're full. So they can't actually control their appetite. And the problem with policy is we jump to simplistic solutions without due attention being paid to the science and the complexity of the issue that underlies it. Just finish with a quote or two. This guy a Catholic priest who about 30 years ago was sent to work in the most violent parish in the west coast of America, south central Los Angeles, where LAPD told him he would be killed if he tried to interfere with the business of the Latino gangs. He went to the church house the day he was there, he dumped his bag and he decided to go and walk down the parish and the police stopped him. No, no, you can't go down there. He said, look, this is what we do. And off he went. And he talked to them and he found out what they were thinking and just generally befriended them. And 30 years on, you can see him here with the Latino gang members. What he did was he realised, he asked them what they needed and he said, well, we need a job. If we're going to give up the fighting and the drugs and so on, we need a job. So he got this guy who was a film producer to buy a disused bakery and he started Homeboy Bakeries. And he told me once that he needed, that within a few weeks he realised he needed to start a second business which was Homeboy Tattoo Removal. <laughs> he said that really came home to him. One day he was sitting there and in came one of the homeboys, sat down and said, Greg, you really need to help me. I keep trying to get a job but nobody will pay any attention to me. They just, you know, go to interviews and they just shrug their shoulders and say they can't employ me. And Greg said, I looked at him and he had piercings in his nose and his ears and his lips and so on. But what really drew, drew your attention was the tattoo across his forehead in large letters which said, fuck the world. <laughs> and Greg said, I think I know what your problem is. <laughs> They got a plastic surgeon friend to come, bring a laser, and they started the moving tattoos. And 30 years later, Greg has literally, by befriending people, transformed thousands of lives. He comes to Glasgow at the invitation of the Violence Reduction Unit that have adopted some of his approaches, and I take him to schools occasionally. And what he tells the school kids, and I'm really proud to have got this, it wasn't the Daily Mail which I tried for, it was the Mail on Sunday that printed this. It was about compassion. Not a word you see often in the Daily Mail, I have to say. 
Here's what we seek, a compassion that stands in awe at the burdens the poor have to carry, and one that stands in judgment at how they carry them. When we see people in difficulty, yeah, we should help them, but more importantly, we should try to help them help themselves. Because that's what transforms their lives. That's what the science tells us. And just another quote from a 9th century Confucianist. We indicate to those after us that rather than punish the country's deviants, instead consider the poverty of the multitudes and relieve their misery, then criminals will disappear. The reason why ordinary people act badly comes from an inability to survive. There's no criminality in the country but waste of natural resources. Ninth century, impressive. The reason why ignorant under classes are not honest is because their rulers who should be honest are not. <laughs> I love that quote. <laughs> so, what we are taught to do is to intervene and do things to people. The, the, the paradigm of life as a river and what the health service is, is a rescue system. I mean, I, because I talk a lot about um, healthy places, they made me an honorary fellow of the Royal Incorporation of Architects of Scotland and asked them what did that mean, and it said, well, it, it means you can draw pictures of houses and charge <laughs> a lot of money for it. <laughs> so anyone want to buy this? So the health service is the guy who lives at the top of the waterfall, and what he does is he goes out and rescues drowning people. And the public health system says, why are all these people falling into the river? We'll go upstream and we'll fix the hole in the fence. That is the wrong paradigm to think about health and well-being. The correct paradigm is this. We're all in the river all the time. And one side of the river is sunny and there's a guy handing out beer and mojitos and things and we can float along and it's very pleasant. The other side of the river is where crocodiles and sharks and rocks are. And the challenge is to teach people to navigate the river. Teach them how to stay on the right side. And we do that by thinking way, way before they're born even. So, the question is, how do we create well-being? Well, it's complicated. But it's much more important to support people in ways that allow them to be able to make the right choices. So it's a bit deterministic. It's the environment we find ourselves in. But free will comes in because if we teach people in ways that allow them to analyse the problem and make the right decisions, then we're all a lot better off. So my final word to you is... <laughs> but just get out there and start doing stuff, okay? Okay. <laughs>